God did say to Moses, didn't he, originally, that let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And tonight when we look at the holy place, we're getting a bit more personal than that. God has said, this is the place where I will meet with thee and where I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. And that was to be taken part in the most holy place. So tonight we want to look uh, at a number of things. Uh, we've got uh, quite a full evening. Um, so I've got all the, uh, the quotations on the screen as we go through, but please feel free to uh, turn them up as well if, if you desire. Um, we want to look tonight, just a brief look at the shadow of things to come, what the tabernacle, the holy place, the most holy place represented for us and for the children of Israel. We we'll briefly look at the construction of the most holy place, what it was made of. We we'll look briefly also at the, the high priest's garments and, and what he did, um, particularly in the most holy place. Then have a look, close look at the constituent parts of the, uh, of the most holy place. Look at the veil, the ark and its contents, and look at the, the mercy seat that was ab- upon the ark. <coughs> by doing that, hopefully, it'll give us a feel for the things of the most holy place, what it stood for, and what exhortation we can take for ourselves. If we read through Hebrews, which we have many times, haven't we, brothers and sisters, over the years, we're, we're impressed that the apostle writing there to the Hebrews, he's keen to point out that Jesus and the way of the Lord through Jesus is much better than the sacrifices and the offerings under the law of Moses. And he says, doesn't he, that these things were a shadow of heavenly things, they're a figure for the time, they're present, and the law having a shadow of good things to come. So does that mean that the true Israelites, at the time of Moses, the tabernacle, didn't have a clue of what he was doing or what she was doing, that all there was was a remembrance of sins? Or would they be instructed in a certain manner as well that they would look at the tabernacle and the priest and see for themselves a shadow of good things to come, the Messiah that was coming, the prophet like unto Moses, which God would raise up, which they would hear? I think it must have been that at the time that Bezalel and those that were instructed in the ways of the truth would understand at least a little of the things that they were making and the activities that the priest undertook, or else what was the point for those brethren and sisters at that time? But nonetheless, although God said he was going to dwell with the people of Israel, he was going to meet particularly with Moses on a number of occasions, but thereafter only once every year the high priest would meet with God and commune with him. The rest of the nation were excluded from going anywhere near the, uh, the presence of God. And the apostle there is making that point, isn't it? That while the original tabernacle was standing, the people were actually excluded from the presence of God. But yet, as we're reading it in Christ Jesus, the most holiest way has been opened up. And all there was for those sacrifices was a remembrance every year, year in, year out, a remembrance of the sins of the people. But as I say, for a true Israelite, they would recognise their place before God, but would look forward to the glory to come. We said it's a shadow of things to come. And when we look at Exodus 31, again, I've got the, uh, I said I've got the text on the screen uh, behind me there. We find that Bezalel was given, wasn't he, the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. So it's interesting. He was given the manner of workmanship to build the tabernacle, to sew all the curtains along with his helpers. But he had the spirit of God and wisdom. So perhaps we can picture the that Bezalel and Aholiab and others around them, and Moses and Aaron, when the building all this tabernacle, the equipment, the furniture, that they would be instructed in what these things were actually representing. Because it wasn't just the skill of workmanship, as we see there, it's the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and of knowledge, but also to do the, the cunning works, the, the skillful works of carving of, and engraving of stones, etc. But these things were a shadow. And the name of Bezalel is interesting. His name means in the shadow of God. So even the name of Bezalel has given us a clue that these things were a shadow of good things to come. And what was the good thing to come? Well, it was the new covenant, wasn't it? The writer in Hebrews tells us that the, the first covenant, or the covenant given to Moses and the people, all it was doing was giving them a remembrance every year of the sins of the people. But yet in chapter 8, the apostle there writes, quoting from uh, Jeremiah the prophet, he says, For I would be merciful unto their righteousness in the times of the new covenant, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. 
So there's a real contrast there, isn't there? Under the law, there's a remembrance every year. But when Christ comes in the new covenant, there will be no more remembrance of sins. The idea being that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to bring the people to Christ. They would understand their place before God and would look forward now to the times of liberty, if you like, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what then of the construction? I'm not saying this uh, model here or this picture is perfect, but it just gives us a, a bit of a flavour. We see the outer court, which we've, dis, uh, we've discussed before. We've got the altar of burnt offering, the labour to wash the priests, the first veil, the uh, writer in Hebrews talks about, and the first place. Then he talks about the second veil and the second place being the most holy place, where we see the ark there. I think the scale's a little uh, out of kilter with this because the size of the, uh, the lampstand, it would burn the place down, I think, the size of it. It's massive. Just look, look at the size of the people. to the, um, But nonetheless, we, we get an idea of uh, what's going on there. We've got a plan view there of, of, the, of the measurements. Um, what we don't know really is the exact size of the most holy place. Although all the, uh, the commentaries and, and, and Bible atlases and, and books on the most holy place tells us it was 10 by 10 and 10 cubits high. Um, the scriptures don't actually tell us where the veil of the curtain actually appears. There's no measurement given for that. Although there's some suggestion that uh, there was a joining place of, of, the, of the curtains and the, um, the coverings overhead met at this particular place where the veil was. Whether that be the case or not, it's hard to tell. Um, we are told that the, uh, the boards of the most holy place were 10 cubits high. And we know that the width, so this, this back wall here, given the width of the most holy place, we're told it was six cubits uh, sorry, six boards wide, which was nine cubits. That leaves half a board width for the, for the corner boards to make up ten cubits. We're not sure. It probably is, because if it was ten cubits wide, ten cubits long, we know the height was ten cubits because it was a board length high, then it would make a cube, and probably the first cube mentioned in Scripture. And that's significant, isn't it? Because, as we know, a cubic measurement, all the measurements are the same the length, the width, and the height to make a cube. They're all of one size. There's a unity, I think, being expressed to us there. Um, but just turn to John chapter 12, or you can, you can look at the screen. Um, there's an interesting aspect, the most holy place, to do with God, with do with Jesus, and the brethren and sisters in the most holy place. And we read there that the Lord Jesus is praying um, to God before he was crucified. He says... Neither pray I for these alone, his disciples, his apostles, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's us, brothers and sisters, isn't it? That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So we have God, we have Jesus, and all the brothers and sisters are all one in Christ Jesus. We have the three measurements in the most holy place, representing the purpose of God and the presence of God, which Jesus has now gone forth into that, bringing us into that place also. So it's a perfect cube and perfect symmetry. I think it speaks of unity. The high priest then. We have a depiction there of his uh, beautiful garments, his robes. And we could spend many, many weeks looking at the individual um, items of his, his attire, uh, which clearly we're not going to do tonight. But just note there the depiction of the, uh, the golden censer, which had the coals off the, uh, off the altar of um, burnt offering. So what were these priests to wear? Well, Exodus tells us that, uh, that the priest's office was to be given, obviously, by Aaron and to his, to his sons, his helpers. And thou shalt make, it says, holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. This was the whole purpose, that the priest would be decked in all this wonderful garments, but each telling a story and telling a tale, depicting the glorious um, relationship that God had with his people, and all done for God's glory and for beauty, which should be recognised in the faces of the people. They should likewise be holy, and likewise would reflect God's glory and his beauty. But on the Day of Atonement, the high priest didn't wear all these garments. We've got to look at some sections here in Leviticus 16. It's interesting that 
all these garments for beauty and for glory were not to be worn on the Day of Atonement. <clears throat> what he was to wear was to put on the holy linen coat, linen breeches upon his flesh, he says there, shall be girded with a girdle, so wrapped round with, with a tie round his waist, the linen mitre upon his head. These are all holy garments, and therefore he shall wash his flesh in water and so put them on. We can see there, can't we, the idea of baptism is depicted or given in a figure, if you like, even with the, uh, the priest's attire. That washing of his flesh speaks of baptism, and putting on clothes of righteousness is like putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? But it's interesting now that on this day of atonement, once he got all his garments on, having washed himself, he would then to go out and take coals off the altar of uh, burnt offering, take the coals and put it in the centre, using the, uh, the tongs that were part of the equipment. He'd take the hot coals, put them in the centre, then walk to the most holy place, but carrying in his hand sweet incense. And he'd say, if he'd taken this incense and bring it within the veil, well, clearly before he'd gone out, he'd opened the veil up, so the way was open on the Day of Atonement. He'd go in with a censer into the most holy place, within the veil, put the um, incense on the censer, and the cloud would go up, wouldn't it? Because if God was going to appear there, then no man can see God and live, we told in other parts of Scripture. So Moses is, is telling Aaron that you'll put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat, that is upon the testimony, that you die not. And we can think, you know, the, the priests are going every year, and it was, you know, it was just a ritual, but his life could be at risk. What happened if he didn't take enough coal or the incense wasn't right and it didn't cover the, and God appeared, he'd be killed instantly. So it was, it was quite a thing for, uh, for the high priest upon the Day of Atonement. But we read, didn't we, in, uh, in Hebrews 9, regarding the, uh, the censer, and there's some controversy in, in some parts, not in the, within the meeting, but within the Brotherhood, but other uh, so-called critics. Because we read, didn't we, in Hebrews, that after the second veil, the tabernacle is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer. Now, normally, the golden censer wasn't within the veil. It was always kept and placed on the altar of incense, which was before the veil, before the most holy place, when each morning and each day the high priest would bring that censer and put uh, the incense and fill the holy place, not the most holy place. And some have said, well, the apostle has got his facts wrong, which seems quite remarkable, really, doesn't it, that uh, they could say such a thing. But it is true, as we've said, every day of the year, the golden censer wasn't found in the most holy place. But on the day of atonement, as we read, it was. So clearly the writer to the Hebrews is telling us he's got his mind on the day of atonement, particularly with the office of the high priest, which is trying to show that Jesus was a better high priest, a greater high priest. Not after the order of the Levites, but after the order of Melchizedek. So again, there's no contradiction or problem in the scriptures regarding what we're reading there, as we would expect. Now the offerings that uh, Aaron make were, were quite, uh, quite specific. He had to take for himself and his house a bullock, and for the people he took, took two goats. One was the the, uh, the, sheep, the the scapegoat, rather, which was kept alive. The other goat was sacrificed. Moses gave this detailed um, instructions to Aaron for a particular reason. The bullock was for Aaron and his household. So you can imagine now the tabernacle, the most holy place, the veil is put back. The whole tabernacle by this point is probably full of incense burning on there. And he would take a bowl with the blood and go in and sprinkle before the the most holy place, before the mercy particularly, seven times, and seven is a number of completeness, isn't it? Completely he was to carry out these works that he would be uh, sanctified before God. So he'd go in now for the second time with the blood of the bullock. He'd then go out and bring in the blood of the goat and do the same thing upon the altar, upon the mercy seat rather, seven times. And what was the purpose of doing that? Well, Leviticus 16, 16, that he was to make an, an atonement for the holy place. Why is that? because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation. So it was to clean, to cleanse the tabernacle ready for service for the next year. And having gone in and out three times now, he would then go out of the holy place, out into the court of the, uh, the outer court, 
and go before the altar of burnt offering and again take the blood of the goats and the bullock and sprinkle that upon, upon the altar to cleanse that again, as it says there, is to be hallowed from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And the whole purpose of doing all that is summarised in the last verse there. When he has made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he would then bring the live goat. So the tabernacle itself has been sanctified, has been cleansed from the sins of Israel. And then the, the live goat would be taken, the scapegoat, who would confess the sins of the people and would cast it out into an, an uninhabited place. Again, we won't go into, into too much detail now, but the first sacrifice of the goat was the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second goat represented him going to an inhabited place that was kept alive, speaking of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where did he go? Have he resurrected? Into an uninhabited place, by man that is, that is into heaven. So we can see many types and shadows and symbols in that. But then when he's done all that, is to go back into the holy place, wash himself again, and put on his garments for glory and for beauty. And now, having cleansed the altar and the tabernacle, he could go out and make a sacrifice of his bullock, the rest of his bullock, a burnt sacrifice, on the altar of burnt offering, to rise up to God for his sins, and then likewise for the goat, for the sins of the people, to make an atonement. Now it's interesting to note that Nobody was to be anywhere near the holy place or the most holy place when this was going on. Because clearly, if the veil is, is taken apart, then not only was the most holy exposed, but also the holy place, which was normally where the rest of the Levites would minister, um, helping the high priest. They were excluded. Only one person was allowed to go into the, to the holy place, the most holy place at this time. Again, we can see kind of the analogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one man can serve God truly and honestly, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But can you picture now, the rest of the Levites are outside in the court, and the people were outside of the, of the tabernacle area itself, the, the outer court. The priest's gone in. There's a good chance if he didn't do things right, he could be killed. So there'd be a sense of tension as well for Aaron and his family, and even Moses. Would he come out alive? Because nobody could see him inside there. So would he come out alive? There was an expectation that when he came out, that he actually would come out and, and that everything would be well and that the sacrifices and everything else would be acceptable. Well, I think we can see an analogy again with the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at Hebrews 9, verse 28, it speaks about Jesus once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin and to salvation. So the people were looking for the high priest to come out the second time, if you like, just as we're waiting now for our high priest to come back the second time. And this time he'll come with garments of, of beauty and of righteousness, not just a linen garment, but to be attired all glorious in symbol like the high priest's garments. And what's he going to come back to do? Well, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So we ask the question then, why would the high priest need a change of garments? If all his original garments, his beautiful garments, were for glory and beauty, well, why change them on the Day of Atonement? Well, I think the reason is, is that Aaron, at the time of the Day of Atonement, was not presenting Yahweh to the people, which he was when he wore the garments of glory and beauty. He was now coming before God and was representative of a righteous man before Yahweh. And I think that's the difference that no flesh should glory before God. So the high priest came in simple garments of linen. And we see don't we, in Isaiah, it speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ and his, his, um, his lowliness before he, he came, or before he went into heaven. It says, Jesus shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. I think that's the same principle that we're going to see, that we've seen in the high priest. There's no beauty that we should desire the outward appearance. It's what was represented, what was in the heart that counted. And later on, the servant prophecy says of the Lord in, in prophecy, For God hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. It was through the linen, which is the righteousness of saints, that salvation came. 
And it was symbolized, I think, in, in the high priest. So when we come to the book of Revelation, we can understand the marriage supper of the Lamb, can't we? That the wife has made herself ready. And what's she clothed in? She's clothed in fine linen, clean and white, for fine linen is the righteousness of saints. I think this is picked up from the things we've seen in the most holy place on the Day of Atonement with the high priest attired in fine linen, which is the righteousness. It allowed the high priest to come before God, not with his righteousness, but representing the righteousness which has come from God. When we read the Gospel record, we won't look at any detail at this, but we know the parable, don't we, of the man that didn't have a wedding garment and he was cast out. So the only way we can approach into God to gain access to the most holy place is to put on these linen garments or to put on Christ, isn't it? I think that's what the apostle, when he writes in Romans, is telling us, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. You put on the new man, he says, which after God is created in righteousness and in true holiness, represented by the linen clothing. just like to spend a few moments now looking at the, the various parts of the, of the tabernacle to see what lessons we can uh, learn, particularly of the most holy place. Now there's a principle, isn't it, which we know in Revelation, that uh, Revelation chapter 1, which says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to John, to point out unto his servants the things which must needs to come to pass with speed. And he showed them by signs. Now I think the same principle we see there allows us to look at the prophecy of Revelation we pick up symbols throughout scripture that enable us to understand. And I'm sure that's the same principle that, that Bezalel and Aholiab, when they were putting together the tabernacle and the various components, that God would have given to Moses signs of the things which must, in God's eyes, speedily come to pass. So it's no different for us, brothers and sisters. I don't think it's any different to the, the children of Israel in the past. The true Israelite of God would look for signs and symbols in everything that, that God does, and particularly through his word for, the, for, the, um, for Moses and Aaron, they would see physical symbols before them. We need to look at the symbols that are around us in the world, don't we? But it's the same principle. Keep our eyes open and looking for symbols because God's trying to point out things, as Rotherham's version says there quite neatly. He's trying to point out things that are important to us and for us. So what, what do we find in the, uh, in the furniture then? Most of the furniture in the holy place, the most holy place, as, as uh, Brother David mentioned last time, it was, when it was made of wood, it was acacia wood, and it was overlaid with gold. And wood is related to man, because there's many scriptures, I've just put up one here, that man is likened unto a tree. In particular here, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Why? He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. The wicked have, have uh, described it as, a, as a, a green bay tree, spreading forth their branches, spreading sin everywhere they go. Um, we have the trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh. So trees and mankind, I think, are inextricably linked. What about gold? Well, Job tells us that after he's been tried, he says, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, God's tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And gold, as we know, is purged in, in great heat. We often think that, that faith or gold it represents tried faith. Well, that's only part of it. Faith that's tried, but, but being found worthy, worthy before God, that you be given a golden crown. So I think gold particularly speaks of immortality. Based upon a faithful obedience to God's word, then the reward will be a golden crown. So I think gold speaks particularly of immortality. When we look at the Psalms, the New King James Version, the Psalm of David says that for you meet him, the servant of God, with blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold upon his head. He asked life from you, and you gave it to him. Length of days, forever and ever. A golden crown and length of days again. David had the promises made to him, didn't he? That he would live forever in the kingdom of God. Sitting before, standing before the throne of the Lord Jesus. His throne, the throne of David. And again, when we come to Revelation... Revelation 21 speaks of the tabernacle of God now coming down, dwelling with men. And we find the city was paved with pure gold. So we know it's a kingdom age when it's a city of pure gold with people that have been made immortal with golden crowns. So gold speaks of immortality, I think. And the Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says that 
This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So he says, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. The wood speaks of corruption and mortality. Gold is overlaid on it. This mortal must put on immortality. And I think that's the message we get when we come to the holy place and the most holy place. It speaks of brethren and sisters that have lived a faithful life, their faith has been rewarded, and they've been clothed with gold. So it's wood overlaid with gold. What then of the veil then? Well, the New King James Version gives us quite a good description. He says, You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It seems to be that it was actually stitched together. It wasn't one garment with any printing on it. It was actually woven together so very skillfully. Uh, and we can see the care that Bezalel and his, his um, co-workers did to, to stitch this together. They said it was going to be hung upon four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. And we see the, the meaning we've had before that. What do the pillars represent? It could represent the gospel message. It could re- represent the four living ones. There's many things. We won't dwell on that for the moment. But there's many symbols in there. But this, this veil was hung then using hooks and it was hooked on a pole that went between the, uh, between the bars of the, uh, of the posts there. And then he said the veil was hung by clasps, that last uh, paragraph there. He said the veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. Now, we don't have to guess what the veil is because, again, the writer of the Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 10 verse 19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So like when we're reading the book of Revelation, we're picking up clues throughout the rest of Scripture. Now we're picking up a clue that allows us to go back and look in great detail at things that have gone before. So the veil speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ, or represents him. So what about the various colours and, and, the, and the designs? Well, blue there, I think, represents godliness. Because when we read in Numbers 15, God said to the children of Israel that they were to make fringes and garments of their, or, or the borders of, the, of their skirts or their, of their outer garments and put there a ribbon of blue. And what was the point of that? Well, he says, It shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. So to look upon these things would remind them to keep the commandments of God and to do them. In other words, to be holy like unto God or to be God-like. So we think blue speaks of godliness. Then there's the purple. I think we're familiar, aren't we, the way before Jesus was uh, crucified, he was mocked by the soldiers there. They put him in a purple robe, which is a symbol of, of royalty. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews in acknowledgement of his attire. What about scarlet then? Well, Isaiah tells us that, um, come let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Now, I've said I think scarlet represents human nature rather than sins. Their sins were as scarlet, but we're told that the veil represents Christ. And we know from Corinthians that he was without sin. Because he says, therefore, he hath made him to be sin for us that knew no sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In him. <clears throat> so scarlet, then, I think, represents Jesus' as human nature. He was made sin for us. Sin is just another way of saying that he was of human nature. In every other person, human nature brings forth sin. But in Jesus, we know it didn't. But he was made like unto his brethren, a sinful nature. So he's made sin for us. He came in a bodily form, but was without sin. So scarlet, when we look at the, the veil, represents humanity or human nature if you like and linen that was woven through what we've already seen represents the righteousness of saints so when the garment was finished and hung up what would be the message that those that have uh, that have um, that have put it together and hung it up what message would it be giving them well there's one final thing they would look at why put the cherubim on there why weave those into the into the design well when we read in Genesis 3 chapter 4 we know these verses well but we do read that God or the angels drove out the man and the woman 
And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And that's the first time we get the mention of cherubim. So it's, it's quite appropriate, I think, that these things were put on the, on the veil before the most holy place. It was a divider, as it said uh, earlier in the New King James Version, a divider between the two places, a divider to keep everybody else out apart from one person, the high priest. So let's just put all these things together then. If we think it's the veil then, when we see blue, it's godliness. And Jesus said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, the perfect picture of godliness. Royalty, well, when he comes back to the earth, he's going to be crowned, isn't he? He's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus, as we know, the scriptures tell us, he was made of a woman. Righteousness, there was no greater person that was more righteous than the Lord Jesus Christ. And First John tells us that Jesus calls him, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And the cherubim, keepers of the way, well, Jesus said, didn't he? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we can see in the, in the veil there, all these things woven in tells the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember when he was crucified, that when he gave up his spirit, it says in Matthew, that behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. His veil, which is to say his body of his flesh, was rent. He was crucified. Notice how the veil was rent from top to bottom. It came from God. It was of God's doing that it happened from top to bottom, not bottom to top, from top to bottom, informing us that God was in this, reconciling the world into himself through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the veil is taken apart then, it, relieve, it allows them to access into the most holy place. And we see there the Ark of the Covenant. <coughs> we'll look first at the mercy seat. We see there that it's uh, two and a half cubits um, wide and, and a cubit and a half um, long, three foot nine by two foot three in the old money. Um, what's that? 120 centimetres by 75 centimetres. Um, when we look at the mercy seat, it's not actually known as the mercy seat in, in the Hebrew as such. It's, the word there is kaparet, it means a lid, from a, a root word meaning to cover. And there's some debate on the etymology of the word also that it might also be related to, uh, to the word to atone. But it was a lid. And in fact, um, one dictionary, this is the uh, theological word book of the Old Testament, gives us this description. He says, the word, however, is not related to mercy and, of course, was not a seat. The word is derived from the root to atone. The translation mercy seat does not sufficiently express the fact that the lid of the ark was the place where the blood, where the blood was sprinkled on the day of atonement. And he says the place of atonement would perhaps be more expressive. And I think that's probably right. But we have the mercy seat and, and we have to live with that, I think. Um, but again we're left in no doubt of what the mercy seat represented it represents again the Lord Jesus Christ for Paul tells us that doesn't he what, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation which is the same word there translated mercy seat in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 5 and when we read the Septuagint which is the, uh, the Greek translation of the Hebrew um, Bible it's the same Greek word in the, in the Septuagint as it is here as well so we have that perfect tie that Jesus Christ is the mercy seat. He is the place of atonement, which is the whole purpose of God, isn't it? Reconciling um, us to God through his sacrifice of blood. The tables of the covenant, well, I think that's fairly easy for us to follow that, isn't it? The psalmist tells us that the mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. And the tablets were placed inside the ark, weren't they? So we get the idea of the law of God being inside, inside the heart of the believer. And again in Hebrews chapter 8, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. So we, I think we're getting the picture of the reason why the, the tables of stone were there, with the laws of God, it was to be kept inside, inside our hearts. What then of the, of the pot of manna? Well, Moses tells us that the pot was taken and a selection of the manna was kept for all generations and it was put in the Ark of the Testimony, such as uh, Moses told Aaron to do, which he did. Now, it's interesting that uh, we're not told that it was a golden pot, 
but the writer of the Hebrews gives us uh, more revelation, if you like, that we didn't know before. He tells us that the golden, sort of that the pot was golden, and clearly it had to be. It was in the most holy place, in the presence of God, and only those that have been given immortality can dwell in the presence of God. So we're told that it was golden pot there. But what does a manna represent? Well, again, everything speaks of Jesus Christ, doesn't it? When we're reading John, he speaks to the, the leaders around him. He says, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. It's quite abrupt, isn't he? But this is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. So we can see a relationship again to Jesus in this Ark of the Covenant. It speaks of his flesh. And again, it speaks of eternal life. Those will live forever. And again, right into the, uh, to the Pergamos Ecclesia, he says, encourage them, he that overcome, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. Hidden where? In the Ark of the Testimony? Yes, but hidden in our hearts, isn't it? I think that's the idea. Everything's hidden within us. What then of Aaron's rod? This is, this is quite interesting. Why was Aaron's rod in there? Well, I think this relates to divine appointment. And I'll just briefly go through number 16. We recall, don't we, the rebellion of, of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. How they went to Moses and Aaron and said, look, you're doing too much. Give us a share of, of these duties. And God was displeased with that. And the earth opened up and swallowed them all and disappeared. But then the people said, you've killed the people of the Lord. For they were, weren't they ministers of the Lord, such as Aaron and Moses were? You've killed them all. And then God punished them and it says that 14,700 died that day because of the things that happened and their rebellion. So God was going to put before them now, teach them a lesson of that his divine appointment, his appointment, which is divine obviously, was the whole point of their obedience. Obedience to him to do what he desires. That would be pleasing unto him and not what man wants to do uh, in his service to God. So they were given a task. The 12 leaders of the families were to take a rod and write their name on it and give it to, to Moses. And they laid them all up, these, these rods, in the tabernacle. He says they're before the testimony. So I think it was before the holy place. The veil would be closed because Moses couldn't go in there. Or even Aaron, only on one day. So I think these rods, and Aaron's rod was put before, we put before the veil to see what God would happen. Uh, what happened rather. And God said, the person that I choose, or the rod that I choose, will blossom. And we know clearly from Scripture that it was Aaron's rod, the house of Levi, that didn't just blossom, it budded, and it yielded almonds. Miraculous in itself, isn't it? And again, Moses told Aaron to put this in the Ark of the Testimony as a witness for generations through. So, God chose Aaron. He'd appointed him. Aaron was the only means whereby the people could come to God through the most holy place. Not anybody else, not Korah, Dathan, not Abraham. Only as God has appointed. And there's a lesson for ourselves, isn't that, brothers and sisters? We must keep the ways and the commandments of God as been set out in Scripture. If we do that, then God willing, we shall die not like the unfaithful did in Numbers that we just read there. So what's the spiritual lesson then? Well, there is no other name under heaven whereby we can be saved. Just as there was no other way that, that people could approach God than other than through the name of Moses, uh, Aaron rather, it was written on, the, on that rod, only through the name of Jesus Christ can we be saved. The same principle. God has appointed the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said that again, didn't he, in Acts 17. The Apostle Paul tells those that, uh, of his day in Greece, because God's upon a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he raised him from the dead. And that's the other aspect of this rod. It wasn't just a rod that budded. You could argue, well, if you've taken a rod that's, that's in bud and you leave it, the next day, surely it'll have a bud, because it was the day before, it wouldn't have dried out. But for a rod to bud and bring forth almonds as it did, that is clearly miraculous. And we get the message there, out of a, a dry rod, we're getting life. So it speaks of resurrection, doesn't it? And in fact, the almond was the first of all the plants, the, the blossoming plant in Israel. It was the first to blossom. It was the earlier one. And its name means to never to sleep, the awakening. It was always awake. So it speaks of 
divine appointment coupled with resurrection. So Paul could write, for as in Adam all die, remember we said wood represents man, so again we get another symbol here, part of the symbol, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after they that are Christ's at his coming. So then let's, let's bring these things together then, brothers and sisters. What about the box itself? What does that represent? Well, I think it represents you and I. I think it's the ecclesia, because the box, it was just a vessel, wasn't it? It's like us. It's a vessel in which we're all a part of. We all make up the building, the vessel, the ecclesia, don't we? On top of that box was the lid, which was the mercy seat, the place of atonement, representing Christ. He's the head of the ecclesia, isn't he? So we can see these principles in there. The tablets were inside the ark. We live by the word of God. We've got the word before us. It's the centre of our worship, isn't it? We keep God's commandments. The manna speaks of the body of Jesus. We follow after the example of Jesus. We remember him weekly, don't we, brothers and sisters, as part of our ecclesial duties and privilege. The rod, well, clearly, we're waiting for a change of nature, or if we've fallen asleep, our faithful brothers and sisters, then we're waiting for the resurrection. So that's the hope that we have within us, don't we, brothers and sisters, within this ark, within the, within the brotherhood. Not, not outside the ecclesia, only inside the ecclesia can we get the benefit of these things. What about the cherubim? Well, there would overarching the place where God would appear. So the ark... The lid and the cherubim all speak of the glory of God. It's God's spirit working together. When we're doing the things that God wants us to do, when we're praying faithfully to God represented by the incense, we pray to God, we pray that his spirit will help us in everything we do, whether it's preaching the gospel or helping each other, or whatever we do, we're always dwelling in the presence of God through Jesus Christ, through prayer. And the complete unit, all together, what do we see? Well, we see the time when the tabernacle of God is with man and God is tabernacling with us when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth that all these things that together that God might be all in all that we might be one with Jesus and with God in the typical most holy place so we covered quite a bit there brothers and sisters I hope you found it interesting um, there's clearly an awful lot there that we probably can never see until, until Christ comes back and the resurrection happens when God willing, we can speak to the likes of Moses and Aaron and, and Bezalel and the Holy Hab and learn the things that they learn and discuss these things with them, the eternal things. But I'll just finish now with words of exhortation from, from the Apostle. And I'll just bring the words so we can read them quietly to ourselves and meditate upon them. Thank you.